Yeah, so I'm talking about randomized the numerical linear algebra for efficient deep learning. So this is a joint work with my advisor, Michael, and a lot of other researchers at UC Berkeley. So uh, we will talk about like several papers, but they are the main is also, uh, typically about efficient deep learning. So I put this slide maybe like two days ago since I look at the schedule, there's no one talk about deep learning. So I say, yeah, the keywords of my talk is randomized numerical linear algebra, optimization, Hessian, Eigen computation, and particularly deep learning. And I want to say I'm the first one, but Michael steal the first position from me. I cannot complain about my advisor, so that's all. <laughs> <laughs> so first, I will give some background: what is deep learning, and what what we we use for like the from randomized numerical linear algebra for deep learning. And I will show one case about training, as Michael said in his talk: large batch training doesn't work, and how can we make it work? And also, Michael talk about like, the current model size is like more than like 100 million. So when you want to do inference, it will be very slow. So how can we speed up your inference time? And I will finally give a conclusion. So deep learning is everywhere nowadays. So you it can help you to do like objective detection. So if you put it on your like car, you maybe can it can may help you auto to, to do autonomous driving, and it can help you to detect if you have a cancer. Of course, I hope no one do this. So if you have a cancer or not, and finally it can help you also to do something called semantic segmentation. So it's basically like you need to specify what is this person, what part is this person. And it's a very half, tough task since, as you can see, since some people have some intersections. So you need to specify which part belongs to these people and which part belongs to the next people. Also, you now they said reinforced learning is very popular. So it can, you can train a reinforced learning to play ping pong for you. You can use re reinforced learning to do like Mario games. And I will say the most famous like, news about AlphaGo. So Google published this paper in Science or Natural. I don't, I, not, so they said like, if you train a reinforced learning model and it can beat the best Chinese Go like, human player. And recently, OpenAI published the paper about like, StarCraft. And this is when actually my, Michael mentioned that they cost more than like, several millions to train the model. Since so this is a very, very tough task, since like, the information is not, not like, globally shared by all the agents. So every agent only knows like, the local, like, local information. So you need to decide which one, what's the next step and what do you want to do next step and where am I? So you need to figure out all of these things. So they, they pay more than a million dollars to train this model. So in this talk, people are talking about like, large scale, like your data set is very large and maybe your, like, your parameter is very large. So how large is, are those things in deep learning? So this is just an example. I know I believe most of you know that for deep learning, you just like you have some input image, for example, image. Then you back through like different layers, one, two, three, four, until the very end, and you get the output. And the classifier will tell you it's a dog, it's a cat, it's a frog, it's a chunk, or it's anything else. So for deep learning, so actually the current data set and the current model sets are extremely huge. I would say. So for like for typically for image classification tasks, the model size for our typical like. Um, so so I would say for now it's a so so model, ResNet 50, it has like 200 or uh, 20 million parameters. So if you just store it in like floating point, it's more than one megabytes. And if you and if you want to see the data set, the data set has 1.2 million images, and each of one of them is 224 by 224 by three. And if you want to see the training time, so here's an example. So if you want to train it on a one view hundred GPU, it will take three days. So it's a very long time. And actually, things even go worse these days. So for NLP task, so the, the current like, stage of the art model is called BERT. And uh, we use just BERT base. So I will say this is like the bottom of the current stage of the art. It has 110 million parameters. And the data set has like more than half, no, 15 million sentences. So you cannot imagine how large is this data set. And if you want to train it with like eight V100 GPUs, it takes roughly two weeks. So it's roughly cost like several thousand or like ten thousand dollars. So is there any questions so far? So next I will talk about some background of like Hessian computation of neural network. So for for neural networks, and as we mentioned before, your theta is extremely large and your number of like data points is extremely large. So if you want to compute the Hessian or compute the top eigenvalue of your of your model with, with respect to theta, it will be almost impossible. So there is a way it's called Hessian free method. So as you can see, if you want to formulate your Hessian matrices like 
50 million by 50 million metrics. I don't think anyone can do this. So it's, there's a method called Hessian free. So for example, if you have the gradient with res theta of your L of your loss function, and then for a very for a random vector v, if you do like a like a vector vector inner product, so you will get a scalar. And then if you compute the scalar, the compute the gradient of the scalar with with respect to your theta, you will basically get a second equation. And since v is independent with your theta, so you will drop the second term and you will get this term, and finally you will get a Hessian vector product. So it can help you to compute something like the top eigenvalue. It can help you to do some like stochastic Lanchos algorithm, like also like the thing people talk about several days ago, like the conjugate gradient descent method and other things. So in this talk, we only focus on the top eigenvalue computation. So basically, we only care, care about the Hessian spectrum. So since we can do this like matrix multiplication, so everything like for top eigenvalue computation, everything becomes easier. So you can just use like the most naive method, power iteration, to compute the top eigenvalue. You throw a vector, you do several iterations, and you normalize it again, and you do it again, and again, and finally it will convert. And there are like a typical question here. So two typical questions here. So since we know the data set is, is, is huge, so how many data you need to like generate a good, good approximation? So this may be the only randomized numerical linear algebra part for the, this talk. And the second question is that maybe like the first top eigenvalue, the first eigenvalue and the second eigenvalue are very close. So how many power iterations do you need to generate uh, uh, like to generate the top eigenvalue? So here is the example. So on the left hand side, we compute like the top eigenvalue over base size 128 with 10 runs on CIFA 10 data sets. So 128 is roughly 0.2% of, of the entire training data set. So it's uh, like only a small amount. And the x-axis here is like the for different blocks. Since that we know for neural network, you have different layers. So we compute eigenvalues for each, different, each individual layer. And the y-axis is basically the eigenvalue. So as you can see, actually, the variance is pretty small. So even if like just 0.2% of your entire data set, you can get a very good approximation of your top eigenvalue. And at the right hand side, we show like how many power iterations do you need to generate this like eigenvalue. So as you can see, after two, four, six, eight, after six iterations, it's already almost converged. So you don't need to like to run your power iteration for like 100 or 1,000 iterations. It will be very cost. So is there any questions so far? Okay. So next I'm talking about like efficient deep learning training. So we mentioned before like training a neural network is very costly. It takes like several days to like two weeks. But it's actually only a part of your deep learning like designing. Since as we know, you, when you want to beat the current state of the art model, you need to design a new model. You train it, you evaluate it to say, oh, it's good, then we accept it. It's not good, we drop it. So if we want to get a, like, a very good deep neural network, you need to like, train it again, again, and again. So it's very, very time consuming. So we need fast training to evaluate our neural network. So a very straightforward method is that you do distributed training. So when you want to do distributed training, you need to have a very large batch size. But a large, very large batch size doesn't work, as Michael mentioned in his talk. So why it doesn't work and what's the problem, we will discuss later. So ignore these slides. So for neural network training, you basically have a, like a finding some problem. If, if you use like gradient descent method to compute the gradient and do a descent step, it will be very costly. So usually people do SGD. And in literature, when people are talking about, when people are talking about SGD, you usually compute gradient within like, uh, with, one grid, with one sample. But actually, in practice, like particularly for deep learning, people find out like for this like extremely non-convex problem, maybe you should use a batch of like a batch of samples to compute the gradient. So it's basically called like a batch batch version of SGD. So but people still call it SGD. So here is a, like a, a small line set like actually the name is like a misnomer since like for SGD, sometimes you may increase your loss function. So it's not a descent. Can I have a comment on the debate about the stochastic descent? Just a very brief one. I think it just comes from the order of those two names. Either this is a descent direction, which happens to be stochastic, <coughs> or it's a stochastic approximation of a descent direction. Okay, so I, I think there's a resolution to this. Both, both these views are okay. Okay, I see. So what is stochastic modified? Is it descent or directive that you're saying? How do you parse that sentence? <laughs> 
So particularly like for deep learning, as you can see, like there are a lot of like uh, small local minimums, uh, like sharp local minimums. So it goes down, goes up, goes down, goes up. So you basically get this like plot. So this is like, like a real like real case. So we mentioned like people found out that, like SGD is very sensitive to like high parameters, like specific for deep learning. So for example, your learning rate matters a lot. Your regularization matters a lot. Your best size matters a lot. So we said like batch set, large batch size training doesn't work. So white doesn't why it doesn't work. So actually, the large batch size will like, affect the accuracy, and it affects the model's like, robustness. So basically, it's easy to be attacked. And uh, it, of course, like, uh, affects your training time, since if you use very large batch training, you can reduce your training time. Of course, if you are like, like octers, you can like, tune all of these parameters to make your neural net work and to make your training process work. But actually, we know you don't have like, the computational process. You don't have the human power. So you need to figure out a way, like, how can you to do that? So here is the example to show that large batch training doesn't work. So we train, or people train our like LXNet with batch normalization on ImageNet. So the blue curve shows the training curve for batch size 512, and the orange curve shows the result of batch size 8192. So as you can see, at the very end of the training, there is like a small gap between the large batch training which was the HK, and the small batch training, which is the 500. So it's roughly 2 to 3% gap between them. So why large batch training doesn't work? So there are several different. Can you describe, is there a comparison? Because uh, if you have a larger batch, so yeah. you usually have like a takes fewer iteration to go through as many pumps. <coughs> yes, right? yes. So that, is that a fair comparison, this plot? So usually, like if people count like for large batch training, that if you fix the epoch if epoch training and you train it, can you like get the same accuracy as original or not? Of course, you can train it longer, but it will cost you more, right? It counter your like it counters your like large batch training like uh, intuition, since you want to make your speed like faster and you don't want to increase your like computational cost. So when lab training doesn't work, so there are different hypotheses. So people first argument is very common is that maybe your lab training like gets stuck gets stuck in a, like to to our like saddle points. So why is this is true? Since that if you use the true gradient descent, true gradient descent, then like your since your lab is very large, so you get the if you you are at like a saddle point, then since your gradient is zero, so you can not make any progress anymore. So another very like famous hypothesis is that. Maybe like your library training gets like a chart to a very sharp local minimum. So what sharp local minimum like looks like here? So here is an example. People argue that your training data and your testing and your testing data are from the same distribution, and they said like so you can like generate the performance from your training data to your testing data. But we know it's not true, right? Since like you only have finite data, and maybe your distribution is extremely like complicated, so you can really not generate your like distribution from your training data. So maybe there is like a small different shift between your training data and your testing data. So here we use the black curve to represent your training, <coughs> like training loss function, and the uh, dot red curve to represent your testing loss curve. So if you if your model like stuck at like a sharp local minimum, yes, your like training loss looks good. But since there's a small different shift between training and the testing, maybe your testing performance will be horrible here around here. But if you're at a like, flat local minimum, even there's a small difference, but it's still acceptable. So you will say, yes, this is still a good model. So that's like the things like people argued about. But about this like sharpness and this like flatness, it's basically about like for from an optimization perspective, it's basically about your loss landscape's coverage. So it basically means like for here your your like coverage is very sharp, it's kinda like this sharp local minimum, and here, here, your coverage is very like flat. It basically means a flat local minimum. So here is a question we want to ask is that how can we use this information to like, if we know this like coverage information, can we speed up the training process? So here we propose our method called like Hessian based adaptive best size training with adversarial examples. So I will talk about the like adaptive best size part first. So the intuition is already like shown to you that if like at the very beginning of the training you're at, at this point, so we will use a very small batch training so it can have very large gradient variance to help you to get rid of this region and to get rid to and to reach some like region like with very flat curvature. And at this point, you may say, yeah, you can increase your batch size now, and then maybe we increase to like three thousand or four thousand. 
And at some point, it's, it gets it's even more flat, so we'll increase the batches again to speed up the training. So it's uh, called adaptive batch size. So second component of our method is called adversarial. So what is adversarial? So in the literature, people usually call adversarial, adversarial is like a, like a small, a special case of robust training. So robust training usually like do something like you have some loss function, and robust training will do the, like, the worst case optimization for you. So you will have like an epsilon disk, it said like since as it is epsilon disk, the loss is very high. So this, this one should be get rid of and you should get, reach this point to get like a, a better worst case like performance. So why do we want to do so? So here you can see like there are a, a lot of like bumpies, these are very rugged region. So we hope that the, we hope that the adversarial training or the robust training can help you to smooth out those lost landscape and to speed up your training process so we can increase your base size like even faster. So here is like a base size like schedule. So BL is basically means baseline. So it makes the base size as a constant throughout the training process. And the GG basically a method from Google. So they increase the batch size like at a certain epoch and as they said, we tuned it so it makes it work. You just compare different uh, batch size and you kind of fix the step size of your gradient descent or? No, actually we will also adapt to the ah, okay, learning rate with respect to the batch size. Okay. So as you can see, like our ABS or EPSA method is like increase batch size much faster than the Google's method. So at all we will like use like less iterations if you fix the epoch budget. So here I, I show you some like intuition why we want to use adversarial training. Actually, the, in the literature, people already proved something for convex problems. So <clears throat> Eric Gowis, Aaron, and some other people already showed that if you want to do like uh, this like robust training method, I mean max problem. If you want to solve this like least square problem, but with like some like adversarial perturbations or robust perturbations. So we get A plus delta AX minus B. And this should actually, this one is identical to R. Uh, Lasso problem. So actually, robust training is basically you add some regularizations. Of course, we don't know which regularization actually it adds for to like deep learning problem, but we hope it can work. <laughs> so next, I will show some results on some numerical examples. The first example is about CFR10. So CFR10 basically have like ten classes, and then there are like five thousand examples per class. So it's basically totally there are. 50K training images, and there are another one 10K for testing. <coughs> and then we train uh, ResNet 20 on CFR10. So the different loads basically represent for different batch size, and the different columns represent for different method. So here we want like better accuracy, but with fewer like SGD iterations. Better accuracy field iteration is the uh, better you want. So as you can see, actually, like best as a, like the small batch, the baseline can get roughly 83% accuracy. And if you increase your like increase your batch size, the accuracy decreases a lot. So if you go to like 16k, your accuracy is only like 67 now. And if you use Facebook's method, FB is basically a method from Facebook. If you use Facebook method, yeah, if you increase your batch size by a factor of five, it looks good. But if you increase by a factor of 25. The so accuracy decreases a lot, and it's even worse than baseline if you increase the best size to be 16K. So Google looks good. The performance is very consistent, but like the number of iterations doesn't decrease a lot compared to baseline. So it's roughly decreased like by far, by half. And the last two columns are like from our paper. So our performance is very like consistency with the baseline performance, and we can reduce uh, like the number of SGD iterations by a factor of six to seven, if you like this line or this line. So SGD is a small data set, only it contains 50,000 images and easy, you may argue that it's easy to solve. So he, next we show an example on the image data set, it's the most complicated image classification problem in computer vision community. So as I mentioned, it has 1.2 training examples and another 50,000 for testing. And it consists for 1,000 classes. So on CFR10, like a dog is just a dog. But on ImageNet, a dog can be like specified to be another thing, like dog, working dog, husky, and other things. So even for a human, it's very hard to distinguish all of them, right? At least I cannot distinguish every dog like go in front of me. So, <laughs> so it's really hard. So 
we train our ResNet 18 on it. So if you use baseline, so the basic use a small batch, use batch size 250, 256, you'll need roughly 450,000 SGD iterations. And your final performance is roughly 70.4 accuracy. And then you use our method EPSR ABS, you will, you will reduce the SGD iterations by a factor of 6 to 7, roughly 6.5, I think. And your final test performance is 70.2% accuracy. And we plot the, the training curve and the testing curve here. So as you can see, actually our training curve is almost identical as the baseline, and our testing curve are almost identical to the baseline. So f until now, I just show you some like SGD iterations numbers, but people know when you implement it in like in real world, you need to do some distributed training. So you we will have some like communication time. Also, since we need to compute the Hessian to like to verify should we increase the batch size or not, so we also argue that like, Hessian computation is expensive, even though it only needs like ten iterations. So we implement our method on AWS Amazon Web Site Service, and we use P3 16 large, so it's basically have eight V100s, and we we like specify like each 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 like each component of your training process. So basically, the Hessian computations are, since we are using adaptive batch size, you need to rescale your, like your, el elastically rescale your training process. So this is a rescale time, resize time, and the communication time, and the real computational time. So from this, like the bar plot, you can see like, actually the Hessian computation and the communication time is only like a little bit overhead, of, or is only a small part of your entire training process. And here on the bottom part, we report the exact training time. So for baseline, it roughly takes 125,000 seconds to get the model. And if you use Google's method, it can reduce the training time by a factor of 2.5. And if you use EPSA, it can reduce by four point quarter, four, four and a quarter times like less than baseline. And here's another thing we, we didn't discuss in here, but EPSA tune is basically an extension of EPSA. So if you can do EPSA, you can reduce the training by, by roughly by a factor of eight three quarters. So is there any questions so far? So at some point you showed the, the compared to validation accuracy, right? You mean this so one on this slide? Uh, the 70.4 and 70.2 percent. Yes. So, so the, the validation accuracy for EPSA is slightly below the baseline accuracy, but it was run but it took less time. Yes. So does this mean if you ran it for as long as the baseline, would it exceed the validation accuracy of the baseline, or is there some kind of a, uh, or is it just training to convergence, or like? So this is a very good question. So actually, since we I skip a lot of details of our algorithm, so since actually the, all the hyperparameters introduced by like EPSA, so since we need to increase the baseline, like for example, how how much should you increase, and how like how much your eigenvalue decrease, you increase your batch size. So there are a lot of head parameters. So actually across all the different experiments, we fix those head parameters from like CFR10 to ImageNet. So that's why there is like a, maybe like a 0.2% like difference between them. So if you want to tune it a little bit, actually we believe you can cover this like difference. So a lot of paper you saw like from literature that they tuned like for like for one month and they report the final time like we only need like two minutes to train ResNet 50. But they don't tell you that you they tune this parameter for one month or two months. But here we fix all the head parameters since we tune a little bit on CFR10 and we use for all the tasks. So that's what why we believe it's the, like the difference gap. So what you're saying is that this is not a systematic thing? No. It's, it's just like sometimes so you're a little better, sometimes you're a little worse, but you're roughly the same. Yes. Time. Yeah, so I'm just So next I will talk about like, efficient deep learning inference. So people want to like if there are they like if you can put a natural language processing model on your phone so you can get the exactly same like translations as the online translation. So for example, you put your phone, for example, you travel to some place and you don't have internet and you still want to translation, right? But for now, it's very hard to implement it in like deploy it in your cell phone because it has like 110 million parameters and it may it's like varies for like even the better state of the art model. So there are like, like researchers try different ways to like compress your model. So there are basically there are three categories. One is called a compact neural network design. 
So it's basically when you design your neural network, you design it in a, like a, a small way to shrink your model size. So another is a hardware aware code design. So once you deploy your model into your mobile phone, but it may cost a lot of energy. So maybe you can only use your phone for like half an hour. It's not acceptable. You need to charge it again and again over the day. So hardware aware code design is basically you, you will design your neural network with your like hardware to make it the running more efficient, to make the efficient more efficient. And the third thing is called quantization. So this is like a orthogonal direction to these two components. Since when you do quantization, you basically use like lower precision for your weights and a lower precision for your intermediate activations. So can you reduce, both reduce your model size and uh, reduce the hardware computation. So quantization is so good. So how good is it? So specifically it can reduce, like for, as we mentioned, it can reduce your memory footprint and it can allow, it can reduce your like computational volume and basically like make your computation more efficient. So how efficient it is. So if you just do 32 bit in like inch addition, it only costs 0.1 energy. But if you do 32-bit DRAM memory like computation, it costs 640 like energy. So it's like a, there's a, like a huge difference between like easy computation and hard computation, and it's specifically for like faster like hardware computation. So quantization is so good, but as we know, like good things usually have its dark side. So what's the dark side of quantization? So quantization. It's like you need to quantize like every model and for a specific data set, so it's very costly. From this data, you need from this for this model for this specific data set, you quantize it once. For a different model, you quantize it twice. And there are a lot of like different tricks and like a lot of hyperparameters you need to tune to make it to work. Otherwise, it will totally lost. And there are a lot of like ad hoc rules that you cannot like generate from one one data set or one model to another model. And our talk was specifically to generate, to solve the problem of the ad hoc rules. So what's the ad hoc rules? So we will discuss later. So we propose a method called Hawk Hessian Aware Quantization. So it's a systematic second order algorithm for inference quantization. Mm -hmm. And we can beat all of, all of the state of the art methods for like image classification, object detection, and the neural natural language processing problem. And we remove most of the ad hoc tricks. To make, life, to make life easier. So what ad hoc tricks as I mentioned before? So for example, if you want to quantize a neural network since we can imagine like for different layers, you have different sensitivities. So maybe like for the first layer, it's very sensitive, so you cannot quantize it more, so you put like eight bits weight on it. And for the last layer, it's not sensitive and it, you can use two bits. But maybe the way changes, right? Maybe you can use four bits for your first layer and four bits for your last layer and use two bits for your middle layer. But there are like a lot of these like configurations. If you only consider like two bits, four bits, and eight bits, and you consider for three layers, it's three to the power of five. And for like modern neural networks, you maybe have like more than 100 layers. How can you decide it by hand? It's impossible. It's more than the items in the university or in the universal. So we need to know like which like which part like which part you can quantize more and which part you can quantize less. So when we said like like sensitivity, it's basically like how sensitive is your loss landscape. So here we plot the loss landscape like uh, along the first two directions of your eigen directions. So basically means that the, the most dramatic like uh, loss loss value will it will change along these two directions. And the basic idea is that if this layer is very sharp. This layer has a very large Hessian spectrum. We will use more bits for it. If this layer is very flat, we use less bits. As you can see, if this one is very flat, even you push your like, model to here, the accuracy is still good. For this layer, if you push your model to here, your, your testing performance will be horrible. So you may, you may say, like, this is just like uh, some like, cooked images. It's, it's not real. <laughs> so here we show two, several like, real examples. The first example is, is of ResNet 20 on CIFAR 10, and the X axis basically the different layers or different blocks, and the Y axis is the eigenvalue magnitude, and the Y axis is actually in log scale, so a small difference actually means a lot. So as you can see, like across different layers, the eigenvalue changes a lot. For example, for this layer, the eigenvalue is roughly 20, and for this layer, the eigenvalue is 0.2. So there are two orders of difference between like different layers. So for this layer in our 
Like in our method, we will contest less for this, that we will contest it more. And this is only just one example on CFR10 that people usually ask for like image net results. So here is another result. So this is a Inception V3 model on image net. So across different layers, actually, the, like, the difference increases. So for the second layer, your eigenvalue is roughly 600. And for the last layer, your eigenvalue is roughly 0.5 or 0.7. Here it's a maximum, right? Yeah, only the maximum element. So as you can see, there are like three orders of difference between different layers. So can you contact this layer as the same as this layer? I think the answer is like simple, you cannot. So we will use more bit for this layer and use less bit for another layer. So another quick question here is that after you have all of those like bit settings, should you contact your model at once or not? For example, you contest all of the layers at once and like fine tune your model or retrain your model a little bit to get the final to get the final model, or you should do something like a step by step by step. So actually, people find out like in practice, if you contest your model once and only retrain once, the performance is suboptimal. So usually, what people do is that you you will like contest one one layer, freeze the others, and retrain it, and contest the second layer, third layer, fourth layer, and fifth layer. But what's the correct order? Can you do something like reversely, five, three, five, four, three, two, one, or like something like you change the order arbitrary? So that's like a unknown question before our paper, I would say. So people just try some like ad hoc drills to see if it works or not. So we develop a like Hessian based strategy to decide which one should contest first and which one should contest later. And I will skip the details here since I don't think I have enough time. And I will direct you some results. So the first result is of like ResNet 50 on ImageNet. So the baseline with 32 bit weights, 32 bit, 32 -bit activation. So activation is basically the intermediate result of your neural network. So top one accuracy is 77.4, and their model size is roughly 100 megabytes. So there are a lot of different methods to quantize these models, so one, two, three, four, a bunch of them. So they can roughly quantize your model with like 10 times smaller. And the accuracy roughly, the best accuracy is roughly 75.3. And if you use our HORC, the Hessian based method, we can get like 12.28 times smaller model size. It's roughly like 1.3 megabytes for this model. And we can actually even get like better performance. So this is a HORC V2, so it's just like an ongoing worker. So we make this like work even like better for the first version. So this is like only one task on image classification. And people now argue that image classification is like an easy task. So we show another task on Coco data set. So Coco data set is an objective, objective detection data set. It's more complicated and it's hard to, it's not only like classify the objective for you, it also needs to give a like a bounding box to see where is objective. And for each image, it may have like different objectives. So it may like have three or four objectives. So it's a very hard task. So for baseline for with 32 bits, 32 bits, your MAP, so MAP is basically the accuracy of object detection tasks. You can get 35.6 accuracy. And the model size like increase a lot by like one, 150. So if you use FQ, so a paper published this year, CVPR conference, so use four bit weights, four bit activations, you can, they can get like 32.5 percent accuracy, and this is already the best result in the literature. And the final model says roughly 18.2. So we propose our Hawk V2, so it's basically the Hawk method. So we can get the same like model size, 18.13. And we can increase the accuracy by 1%. So 1% is a big deal since like here you decrease the accuracy by 3%, and for now we decrease the like accuracy by 2%. And finally, we show an example of um, nat natural language processing. So code NL is a, like a data set on um, natural, natural language processing. So if you use the baseline, your F1 is so another accuracy metric for NLP. You can get 95%, 95. And the model size is extremely huge. It's 5, 410 megabits. So here we don't, like, if, don't like report the activation bits since we use eight activation bits for all of them. And we report as something called embedding. Since we know for recommendation system and for NLP tasks, the embedding layer is extremely large. 
is the lookup table is very large, so we report the size both include weights and embedding and the one without embedding. So as you can see, if you use like our method Cuber, for now we change another name since from another paper. So we use 8-bit weights and 8-bit embeddings, we can roughly get like 74.8 accuracy and we can reduce the model size by a factor of eight, uh, by a factor of four. And then we can push this like weight and embeddings like further. So if you use like, look at this line, if you use three bit weights, eight bit embeddings, we get like roughly the same accuracy as eight bit and eight bit. And then we can reduce the model size by a factor of eight. And if you look at without this like embeddings, so we can push the model size like 11 point something smaller. And if we want like, can you do it like even smaller for me? So we can use like two bits. So with two bits, like we can make the accuracy to be like 74.4, so roughly 0.6 degrees from the original model. And we can make your model size roughly like 14 times smaller. So now it may be possible to put this model on your phone. So is there any question so far? So like second order information, so see here is like a short conclusion. So second order information can like be computed from numerical linear algebra and specifically randomized uh, version of it. And it's very useful to like improve the speed of your neural network training and can provide a very useful information for neural network quantization for inference to speed up your inference and to make it work on your phone. I think that's all. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so you mentioned that uh, I mean I noticed that some in several occasions you had to tune quite a bit to I mean you mentioned there was some tuning yeah. to get to the basically the best performance like the best compression type possible. You mean for the quantization part or for the tuning part? Oh, both parts. Like in both parts, you had to tune the prime. Like I'm just curious because these are randomized primitives, and I've had very varied experiences with. Why I try to get a randomized parameter? How much? What sample size do I take, and so on? How how complicated is that space, and what kind of so? If you like, for example, for 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 training and for large batch training, so specifically people tune like learning rate and batch size. So roughly, if you look at online specific some GitHub repos, they will see you will see some word like I tune this algorithm for like several weeks, but I cannot make it work. So as so you can imagine how hard it is to tune those things. All right. Um, all right. Well, thanks again.